America, a country with some of the most brutal criminals in the world. And fighting back are some of the world's toughest cops. Yeah, he's round the back. I had a shot in there. It's a job where murder, drug wars, and gun crime are part of everyday life. Come here. A job where doing your duty could cost you your life. They're running, they're running, they're running. Run. We got one. Now I'm joining some of these cops on the front line in the battle against the bad guys. We got him. Yeah. This is New Orleans, the Big Easy. But there's nothing easy about being a cop in this place. He's running. We've got a runner. There, up across the road. Stop. Come here! Get down! Yeah, he's around the back. The police are fighting a war against ruthless drug dealing gangs, and the city is awash with guns. You know you shouldn't be having a gun at 16, though. New Orleans has the highest murder rate in the country. We're killing nearly every two days. They noticed the uh, AK-47. That was one of the, the weapons used in the shooting. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina blew into town, and the city descended into deadly lawlessness. We got to steal from each other so we can survive and feed our children. It was almost apocalyptic. It was a free-for-all. Now I'm going on the front line with the men and women that will stop at nothing to rid their city of violent crime. Please, come on! New Orleans, Louisiana is nestled in the deep south at the mouth of the Mississippi. It's a beautiful city with a turbulent past. Uptown, the picturesque French Quarter pays homage to its original settlers. But just a few miles away, Downtown tells a different story. Violent crime in the city is amongst the worst in the US, which has led to New Orleans being recently ranked as having the highest crime rate in the United States per head of population. Somebody came and shot you all up in your head, huh? The police face a lot of weapons, with some New Orleanians permitted to carry handguns in their cars and on their person. I'm here to roll with the NOPD Special Operations Unit. These guys are no ordinary cops. They deal with everything from tactical assaults to targeting the city's most violent criminals. Vows, or the Violent Offenders Warrant Squad, are gathering for a briefing in the 6th District. Uh, at this point, we're going to walk through the door, we're going to go out there, we're going to grab these guys, and just make sure that you guys don't... I don't want to end up with anybody getting hurt. Vows has been assigned 37 criminals to arrest wanted for drug dealing in the city. 1099 address, Troy, please. Officer Fred Faff has served on the New Orleans streets for 15 years and with the warrant squad for four. All right, 10 4. Our main job responsibilities are locating wanted subjects. The warrant's sent to us, and we're, our task is to go out and try to locate that subject and, and put him in jail. The individuals that we're looking for now are drug dealers. So there's, there's a possibility that these people can be armed. Uh, but yeah, we're at the location now. Hold on a second. All right, the gate's locked in the back. I can't get through. Fred and the unit approach the house and knock on the door. After a short while, they make contact and the lady answers. As the officers search the house for the suspect, they make a discovery. You got something on you, baby? Oh, yeah, I'm not, no. Put your hand behind your back. Who flushed that coat? You want coat? Cocaine. That's in the bathroom, baby. I don't have no cocaine. There's drugs in your bathroom. In your turn, okay? I don't sell no okay. drugs. That shit in there too? Yes. 
I'm getting the fuck out of here. <laughs> it's left to Officer Mike Hamilton to recover the submerged drugs, which the suspects have attempted to flush down the toilet. <sighs> Love of the job. That's suspected heroin. Roughly uh, an ounce of raw heroin. The Vows unit strike it lucky on their first warrant of the day, and they uncover $50,000 of raw, uncut heroin and over $2,000 in cash. With neither of the subjects in the house willing to own up to the drugs, both are arrested and taken to jail. The Vows unit are on the front line of the crime war in New Orleans. Every day, they are charged with bringing in the city's most wanted. From armed robbers and murderers to prison escapees and drug dealers. Distribution of heroin. I'm not selling heroin. Please, the They often face hardened criminals with a lot to lose. So a tough and uncompromising approach is always necessary. Go to jail. Distribution of crack cocaine. Me? As the day rolls on, Vows round up 30 wanted criminals and a large quantity of illegal narcotics. Open the front door! Successfully removing drugs and the drug dealers from the city streets. I'm joining Fred for my first patrol with Vows on the mean streets of New Orleans. What do you think about our boys? Our, our cops don't carry guns. There's no way. There's no way that I would go out on the street without a gun. You wouldn't? Not here, absolutely not. We, they have criminals all over the country, but in this city, they're savages. They're just, they don't care about anything. Our first warrant is for a man wanted for an assault on his girlfriend and criminal damage to property. But I want to earn my place in the patrol car and prove I'm not just here for the ride. In New Orleans in 2007, there were over 3,000 arrests made for domestic violence. Can y'all push on this gate for me real quick? Well, With nobody push answering push, at the front door, door Fred tries to gain access to the backyard to see if there's any sign of life. There it is. Finally, after some determined yeah, police work, We get contact. Come to the front of the house, the police. Hey, yeah. How's it going? Morning. Hold up. You have a shirt? Yes, I have. I have hey, a shirt. hey, listen, dude. Yes, sir. Calm it down, yeah? Okay. Take it down or not? I am. I am. I'm, I'm surprised. Girl. Your girlfriend, whatever y'all, what's going on with y'all? She, she put charges on you. We didn't do it. Okay. She did it, okay? Well, that's a big mistake. You have a warrant okay. on you, okay? That's why we're here, all right? As the suspect is led from the house, his aggressive nature becomes apparent. Some think the sergeant is quick to subdue. This is embarrassing. You treat a man like a rat. Like a what? Like a rat. You're not being treated like a rat. You treat your girlfriend. I did not. OK? So I come out and go I would never hit anybody. I, did, I, did I say you hit him? No. You threatened him. The guy come out. <laughs> Don't treat me like a rat. The sergeant just went mad. We'll put you in a fucking cage. We'll treat you like a rat. <laughs> it was my first case with Fred, and I was proud to have aided in the arrest of a wanted man. <laughs> when I opened that gate, it was like, I can't express the satisfaction. <laughs> and when Fred said, wiggle the gate, Wiggled the gate. I wiggled the gate, and it opened up, and it just opened up the case. <laughs> Absolutely, you got that right. So, we could be getting a taser gun or something by lunchtime, probably. I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana, with the Elite Special Operations Unit. Oh, yeah. the man. When they're not serving warrants on some of the most wanted criminals in the city, they're on SWAT duty, knocking down doors and storming houses. It's my first time at Special Ops HQ, and I'm impressed. The ring in the corner is the unit's proving ground, something I'm going to experience later. Yeah. When I arrive, they were looking over surveillance footage of the target's house. Perimeter team, you got to take bolt cutters with you and get into that fence. 
Cut that fence and get to the rear. Well, we won't know until we get there. But see all that shrubbery. I'm told they're also looking for weapons used for multiple murders and armed robberies. All right, just gonna have them hold on that, wait for the red team to make entry into the house, dominate the house, and wait for the car to move to the back. Correct. Because of the dangers involved in the raid, I'm told I won't be allowed to ride with the boys in the SWAT truck. Instead, I'll be rolling with Lieutenant Brian Lampard. All right. You know, 10 minutes, guys. You imagine we'll be Dal and Pig. As we prepare to leave, I'll receive an update on the surveillance operation at the house. Line up the perimeter, The homicide, I've just said to uh, Brian that the, the guy is there. Six foot odd. Um, got a pit bull and there's a, there's a woman with him as well. So the target is actually there, so this could be really exciting. Let's go, pass you up. Because of the high risk of the weapons being used, the SWAT team needs to hit the house in numbers. On this raid, nearly 40 police officers are involved. Let's go, roll up. What, what, what's the dangers here now, Brian? Well, we're discussing it in the briefing. This guy's wanted for murder. Yeah. Uh, he obviously has violence in his past, depending on you know how bad he wants to stand his ground. It's got the potential to be a, a violent encounter for us. I don't know how they feel. I've got the adrenaline going. It's good. There's the house there. Should be ready for it. They're all going up the side of the house. SWAT raids are fraught with danger. With a high possibility of a shooting of a suspect or officer, I'm happy not to be first through the door on this one. They're bashing the front door in. They're going in, they're going in now. They're all in there now. Everybody's inside, has a lot of sh shouting and screaming. It was tense in the car as we waited outside for an update from the SWAT team. Are you holding the, uh, the target? I got it one female. Here comes a woman. There's a lady come out. Red as well. team, the blue team. Red team leader, we're making a move upstairs. Corey, get the intel. With no the sign of the target, I'm allowed to move forward towards the house. It was really quick. I mean, they literally was here, up the side, round the back, through the front door. Really effective. Really, really good. They've got one woman in there. So whether the guy got out or what, I don't know. But the trouble is, when they're coming in, they've got so many of these kids on corners with cell phones, I think they get tipped off. That's the battle. These guys, you know, they've got, got, they've got lookouts on the corners on the cell phones. So whether he's out and gone, the car's still here. She's over there still screaming and shouting, so we'll have to wait and see. With the house now safe, I went in to see what the team are up against. I think some dogs. Another, there's two more dogs in there. One come out. There's a pit bull around the side. <laughs> Officer Chad Ganyon was first through the door. You never know what you're going to get. I mean, uh, you know, the warrant is a homicide warrant, so you know you're going after a guy who's already committed a homicide. His potential for violence is very high. You never want to see those days where not. Even though the target wasn't in the house, the SWAT team recovered a weapon used in a double murder. The gun will eventually be destroyed, along with the estimated 2,300 firearms the NOPD recover every year. I'm impressed watching the unit in action. These guys know what they're doing and are clearly very good at it. I'm disappointed not to have gone through the door with the team, but they've told me I can prove my worth to the unit in an initiation test that they have planned. <laughs> my reputation precedes me as a bit of a hard man, so they've told me I need to face one of their tough guys in the ring. To them, I'm Hollywood, but they don't know I've recently spent six weeks in a gym training for my last movie. Oi, I'm the only traveller who's won six years in a row. I've done a... Um, the Strength and Honor movie with um, with Michael Madsen. And I was in the gym for six weeks and uh, really got into it. And you realize how hard it is. I'm ready to fight, but then Jeff, unit's prize fighter, steps through the door. Jeff? Yep. How you doing, man? Yeah, it's good to meet you. Hey, man. Hopefully, he's got an extra thick head guard for me. Absolutely. And he takes it easy on me. Nah. Because <laughs> we got to work tonight. And this has become precious now, so 
What are you, 220, Jeff? 230? Wait. Yeah. 265. 265, there you go. And I've just I've just lost about 12 pounds. As I'm giving up a weight advantage, I'm going to have to draw upon my speed and nimble footwork to get through this fight. Whether that will last for two rounds is doubtful. I'm sparring for the honor of the SWAT team. <laughs> Fighting for Britain. Flying the flag for Britain. Never. We'll see. As long as you don't put me on my ass, I'll be fine. If he does, I'll cook him in the bollocks anyway. I'm going to wear this in case he throws a low shot. I'll, uh, I'll still be able to have some kids. <laughs> this is my chance to prove myself in front of the boys. And they've all turned out in four to see Jeff take me down. I don't know. This is going to be a close one. I don't know how the man can do it. But the young buck can hit hard. I know that. I started well, managing to get a few good jabs in. But then my fitness started to tell. The legs couldn't keep up with the heart, and Jeff got through the guard. <laughs> he caught me with a leg wobbler right on the chin, but I managed to stay on my feet to hear the bell. Don't tell Vinny now, but if he beats Roach, we're going to book him. He's going to jail. <laughs> fucking out of shape, dude, I tell you. You've got to wait on your fucking moves. I have to admit, Vinny's fighting a better fight than what I expect. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I got some grab in. I came out fighting in the second and gave it me all. I'd given it my best Ooh. shot. I was just happy not to be lying flat out on me back in front of the boys. Jeff saying I'm coming in a bit low there. He was waiting for me to throw it, but caught me one where Ooh. I, I'd have to take the first round because I because I caught him with that hook. Vinny's gonna have to take the second round because he uh, he put a few punches together on me I couldn't defend. So uh, we'll uh, we'll definitely call it a definitely call a split decision. You know he might have threw the fight because he uh, you know he didn't want to go to jail. Yeah, that's. I might not have won. But I earned their respect and a place alongside them for the notoriously eventful night shift. But the dangers for the unit in New Orleans today pale in comparison to what they faced in 2005. That summer, New Orleans was hit by a storm greater than any before. Hurricane Katrina gained pace over the Caribbean Sea before unleashing all its fury on the Big Easy. The sea level rose until the levees couldn't take it anymore. These streets are, look like rivers and canals. Almost immediately, more than three quarters of New Orleans was under five feet of water, and 70% of the city's police officers became homeless. I'm lost. That's all I had. That's all I had. Jason Samuels was one of many NOPD officers that stayed in the city to help its citizens. It was almost apocalyptical. Probably 85% of the city was underwater, at least three to four feet, which you had families uh, stuck and needed rescuing. And then the other 15% that was out of water, you had millions of people heading that way to basically steal what they wanted, what they needed, or just try to find safety. They said, send everybody to the Superdome. That was horrific. There was murder, there was suicide. Conditions that were so horrible that I had to get out. More than half of the city fled. But with New Orleans in its hour of need, Jason knew he had to stay. He regrouped with the rest of the unit in a nearby school. I mean, you basically learned a survival mentality. We went and found stores that maybe weren't flooded where we were able to get socks and, and some type of food stuff, canned food and everything, to where we were able to sustain ourselves until help arrived. Jason and the Special Operations Unit patrolled the city with the Army rescuing those in need 
and recovering the bodies of some of the estimated 2,000 people that died. Local law enforcement is awesome. You know, they're routinely running through about every 10 minutes. So. Amazingly, Jason did all this with an open gunshot wound in his leg. Just over a month before Katrina hit, he was involved in a shootout with a fleeing criminal whilst on duty in the city. The gunshot wound in my, uh, my groin area had never closed, so I was constantly bleeding. My left leg swelled up to probably uh, two to three times its normal size. The pain was such that I would crawl to uh, you know, where my boots were or whatever and get dressed, and I just put on my gear and went to work. Even now, the city is still recovering, but the heroics of Jason and his fellow NOPD officers will always be remembered. As far as American police, I don't think there's any other unit that's been through what we've been through. It was akin to uh, guys going overseas to war together. Without a doubt, the special ops unit excelled in the city's time of need. And listening to the heroics of Jason makes me proud to be serving alongside them. But as I was about to find out, when night falls, the challenge of being a cop in New Orleans becomes even greater. I'm in New Orleans, Louisiana, a city blighted by drugs and illegal firearms. I've seen the Special Operations Unit in action looking for weapons. They're going in, they're going in now. And arresting drug dealers. But the frontline policing is done by TAC patrols who roam the city's toughest neighborhoods tackling crime as it happens. That's not mine. Don't we'll be playing no games. I ain't playing no games. Officer Christian Frick is heading to one of the city's most crime ridden neighborhoods. Tonight, we're in the 5th District, and we're going to uh, look for uh, some uh, no drug hotspots. You know, we'll see what we can uh, shake up in the neighborhood, and uh, hopefully we can get uh, a few of these uh, troublemakers off the street. We're in a bleak ball, river ball, go two blocks The night is still young when Frick gets a call to assist other officers on the scene of a triple shooting. Yeah, this is actually going to be the scene right here on the left with all the news cameras. Watch this Frick, you only watch this Frick. Don't go no shoot. On the scene, Frick discovers that three men in a 4x4 drove past and sprayed everyone on the pavement with an AK-47. One of the victims is a 16-year-old boy. The crime actually happened right here by the car where all the cones are. From there, once the shots rang out, the victims probably ran over to this tire shop at which point they were hit, and unfortunately, one's, uh, one's down, and uh, he's been pronounced dead on the scene. Away from the murder scene, the chase for the killers continues. Officer Frick gets information that the car used has been abandoned nearby after a brief chase. All three subjects bailed out of the vehicle, and fortunately for the police, they left the, the, the AK-47 inside the vehicle. Officers caught two of the perpetrators as they ran from the car, but one still remains at large. As Christian returns to the car, he gets a call that the remaining wanted man has been spotted. Alright, Saint Marie, the airport. You running across Saint Marie? Saint Marie and airport. Come on. We got a guy uh, fitting the script of, the, of this 34S of the shoot. He just ran across the street here. He's gonna uh, bunker down now. We got this perimeter set fairly quick over here. And we're gonna stop right here. This is gonna be our corner. We're gonna get out on this corner here. Set up this perimeter. As the killer darts through the gardens, the units in the area quickly cordon off the block that he has last seen him. We're going to have a solid perimeter on this guy now. Uh, the subject uh, crossed uh, one street, now he's going to be in this street here. The K-9 unit arrives and searches the area, but unfortunately, it fails to pick up on the perpetrator's scent. The search is hampered by the number of empty houses left sure. over from Hurricane Katrina that act as good hideaways. They could go anywhere in these abandoned houses. And uh, on that last block, there was only two houses that people were actually living in. After looking for over an hour, the search is eventually called off. 
With two suspects in custody, getting the name of the third won't be difficult. What you doing, bro? Uh -oh. However, for Christian not to find the suspect is still frustrating. It's aggravating. I mean, you got, we've been out here for an hour. You got numerous uh, officers out here concentrating on this area, and we can't do anything about it. Now, 30 rounds. Clearly, when the sun goes down, the criminals come out to play, and the job of the police becomes even more difficult. The following night, I hit the streets with Officer John Barbetti, who has survived many close encounters. Pretty much controlled, but, you know, there's murders every day. Your first gunfight, how did that come around? It was interesting. We had an informant working with us, and uh, he said there was going to be a deal going down, and uh, we were going to try to jump it around, and uh, it ended up into uh, turning into a gunfight right then and there. What, well, he, he jumped out with the gun? Um, yeah, two passengers and the driver all had guns. How long ago was that? That was um, in 2000, 2001. You've had a few more since then, have you? Yes. I'm slightly worried I might be going on patrol with a bullet magnet, but thankfully, we're hitting the ghetto in numbers. Hey, you got anybody with you? We're traveling in a special tactical group known That's as the me. Wolf Pack, a gang of cars that stick together to flood a particularly difficult area. All we do is uh, mostly proactive kind of work. Try to stop it before it happens or, or while it's happening. This is uh, the Ninth Ward area, a lot of chasing, uh, a lot of weapons violations, and, uh, heavy into narcotics. He's going to stop this guy right here. Check him out, kind of watch his hands, see what kind of movement he does. Right, check this car real quick. I'm learning arrested, that man? working as a street cop requires a different Never set been of arrested? skills. Do we make you nervous? You all right? Yeah, you sure? Well. Your heart's going 100 miles an hour. The tactical units act on instinct, identifying who to stop. Stand right next to the guy. Seeing Barbetti in action, I'm picking up how the wolf pack operates. Then a call comes through on the radio of another unit needing assistance. Bring you guys over here to the 4,000 block. On the scene, a young suspect is in custody, and then I notice why. Fuck. You had that gun? Yeah. What you carrying a pistol for, bro? Officer Wagger's pack was first on the scene, so I asked him what happened. We saw the subject emerge from the corner on the bicycle. He hopped off the bicycle and started fleeing on foot, digging in his pocket like this, believing he had a, was concealing a weapon, concealing a firearm. We hopped out, we started ordering him to stop. He continued running. As he got about up into this area right here, he removed the firearm from his pocket, tossed it onto the concrete here. Officer Boudreaux tased him, and he was quickly subdued. How old are you? I'm 16. 16. Unbelievably, the suspect cycling around with a loaded gun isn't even old enough to watch one of my films at the cinema. 16 years old. As the case unravels, the armed cyclist provides a novel excuse as to why he's carrying a gun. He said he chased a chicken under the house, missed the chicken and found the gun and the bullets under a house while he was riding his bike. <laughs> <laughs> As excuses go, this one ranks right up there. I went to speak to him to see if there were any holes in his story. What happened with the, with the gun? Where did you find the gun? Over there? Not over here, the street. What, was a chicken under the house? I was chasing a chicken. What, why were you chasing a chicken? I sell a chicken. I the money, buy my clothes. You get $10 a chicken. $10 a chicken? How many did you get in a day? Huh? How many did you get? I ain't catching nothing. I found a gun. I was going to sell it. Are you quick enough to catch a chicken? Yeah. You sure? You know you shouldn't be having a gun at 16, eh? I already know. Why well, didn't you? You should have just stopped the, stopped the policeman and just gave him the gun. So look, I just found this gun. Then you wouldn't be in no problems. I want to get no reward for that. Look at your reward now, then, huh? You know what I mean? You're going to have this forever now, dude. In order to stop the chicken chaser from fleeing, the officers deployed a taser device. This temporarily stuns the suspect with 50,000 volts of electricity. Is that the first time you've been tasered? First time I ever got a chopper like that. Did that hurt? Shaking like a chicken. <laughs> you were, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Shaking like a chicken. <laughs> Maybe we get $10 for you then. <laughs> yeah, you made all these policemen come out here. <laughs> Have a seat right there, man. The kid's funny, Good but luck. I doubt how honest he's being. I know. In your lens, even 16-year-olds are involved in toes. serious crime. He's not going anywhere. I mean, a lot of the armed robberies and stuff like that, and even nowadays, the murders, are the, the perpetrators are getting younger and younger. So who knows what he had and what he had on his mind, you know? Watching the wolf pack deal with the armed cyclist, it helped me understand the challenge these cops face. And rolling with John and the boys is starting to get me thinking more like a cop. Is this you? Yeah. on the floor then. Jennings, now it's a nine millimeter. As the night wears on, we're coming up against more and more guns. And I start seeing what the cops are up against each time they step onto the streets. Two guns, two stops, two guns. It's an eye-opener to be riding with John and the Wolf Pack, witnessing firsthand the dangerous job they do out here. It looks like a train of we received a call to respond to yet another stop and search when the unit ahead spots a suspicious car at the junction. Bar Betty tells him just in case he needs backup. Then a simple stop and search turns into a car chase. He's running. We've got a runner. We've got a runner. Chasing a car right now. He's um, running from the police. Just gotta watch these intersections. Bro, bro. It's so dusty, we can't see a lot. Up ahead, the criminal's car turns right. So John takes an earlier road to see if we can head him off. We're par parallel in him right now. See if we can cut him off. As we wait for the car to emerge, the chasing unit radio, and they tell us that the wanted men have crashed and are now on foot. Is he running, John? Yeah, he's on foot. This, he's right out here someplace. Keep an eye on behind. Yeah. 5400 block. I was scouring the houses looking for a sign of the two criminals. There, there cross the road. Yeah. Just ahead, I spot one of them running in front of us, and he heads into the bushes. In there, huh? Yeah, he cut across. He's on Royal, Royal. 2100, going toward back toward St. Claude. Stop, back up, go back! Come here! Get down! Get down! Get down! Talking, With Barbetti in the bushes chasing the suspect, someone needs to get round the side and head him off. Yeah, he's round the back. I need to set up a perimeter. Somebody need to call out the name. What are wearing? You got him back there? Thankfully, another unit was there to tackle him. Otherwise, I would have had to notch up my first takedown. What other way, man? Go other way. But there was still one fugitive at large. I think there's another one. Is there another one? I saw the fucker run behind us into the bushes. <laughs> Is there another one? Yeah, there's gonna be one more. We got the driver so far. K9 has already been called, bro. K9 has already been called. I'm gonna put him on this side, bro. Yeah, y'all hold that uh, corner right there. You back it up. Right there. Oof, that was the real stuff. John just said to me, keep an eye out behind. I look behind, I just see him run across the street behind us. When he was going so fast, any little kids, anything, yeah, they just killed him. You got him? <laughs> they got the one, yeah. Yeah, we flushed it. The one we, we saw coming. I saw him. I couldn't get back to that fence fast enough. I, get, I got wailed in the face with a tree branch. I just saw him out of the corner of my eye, just running. I said, that was the a good one. I said, I looked back and I saw you. I was looking at him. <laughs> While we wait for the canine unit, I go to where the car crashed to find out how the chase ended. 
Here's the skid marks right back here, look. And there's the skid there. So they've gone through there. Try to rectify it. Lucky it never went through the house. I think they, there must have been a cop car here, so they've just they've, they've spun it in here. There's one of the hats there, so... The other guy's saying he was the... He was the in the passenger seat, but looking at this, it looks like he was the one we got the driver. Uh, they're checking it. It's stolen. It's gonna be stolen. You stole the car? Yeah, he stole the car. He picked me up. K9 arrive on the scene and I direct them into the block where the remaining fugitive was last seen. Yeah, John chased him across this street. This one came into here, the one they caught. So the other one might be in the other block. Yeah, did y'all see him? You saw him come out? We scour through gardens and search the abandoned houses, not knowing what we might uncover. My heart is in my mouth. Yeah, they don't know whether he's got a gun or not. They didn't find a gun in the car. So that's why everywhere they look, they've, they've got the guns out first. A million places to hide. After over an hour of meticulous searching, the K9 unit called it a day. We went into every garden. Dog never picked up anything. Car's pretty smashed up, as you saw. That's nearly a right off, I'd imagine. But you did a good job spotting them. Yeah, we spotted them all right, but yeah. just frustrating we never got the other one. Yeah. But it was good eyesight and uh, led to an apprehension. Yeah. Thank God we were close and there's one less criminal on the street. But there's so many places in there to hide, man, I tell you. I'm proud to have helped John and the Wolf Pack get an arrest, but it's sad to see yet another yeah, young teenager in the hands of the law. After the adrenaline of the chase wears off, I'm left feeling thankful that this time no weapons were drawn and that the boys can all head home tonight. I'm in New Orleans in the deep south of the United States. It's been a privilege to roll with one of the best units in the NOPD. Witnessing firsthand the challenges they face and helping them to apprehend the bad guys. Yeah, he's round the back. For my last night, I'm teamed up with Sergeant Dave Duplantier, a local New Orleanian who joined the police after growing up in the hood. How long have you been in the force and why did you join, Duff? I've been on a little over 18 years now. and. Uh... I was always curious about police work, but I was always kind of on the other side. I, was never, I, was, I wasn't a bad kid by any means, but you know, you do things that teenagers do, so. And we hung out a lot, so we got stopped and checked out a lot. You know, there used to be at least a code amongst criminals and, and, and that bad seed of the world, you know, where they, they would deal with each other, but they kind of left the elderly and, and, and the innocent out of it. Not anymore. Even though Dave knows the ghetto better than most, he understands he can't take any situation lightly, and all the units must stick together. Not everybody in these neighborhoods are bad, but you got that rough element in the neighborhood. And even those that aren't bad, they're going to side with their blood. They're going to side with their family. And we're not family. For instance, the neighborhood, see how many people will be out there, how many threats that are around us. It can become a pretty hostile situation. But then they're the first ones to call you guys. Yeah, one on the inside, go. All right, turn it right on. Yeah, you yeah, turn it right on, beat. Oh, I'm walking down. As we drive through the city, Dave receives an urgent call and the lights go on. Talk to me, where you at? What was that, though? They got a guy running on foot and bolted on him. Uh, they got a little 75. The worst call a cop can get is to hear a fellow yeah, officer is down or is struggling with a suspect because he knows to get away, he will have to use any means. Right now, they got a, uh, they got a fight going on. With some officers? Yeah, they got some officers involved. You good? Everybody good? When we arrive, the area is flooded with cops to control the situation, and three suspects have been apprehended. I'm told that as the officers went to apprehend the suspect, 
a gun was pulled. Might be easy to get home. And after a brief struggle, it was thrown into a nearby alleyway. The number of units is justified, as this street corner is at the center of a gang war. The suspects okay. arrested are most likely gang members, armed and ready to protect their turf. After checking the rear of the property, Dave makes an alarming discovery. Uh, poor man's version of a Benelli. The gang had hidden a laser-sighted semi-automatic machine gun in the back garden. A sign that gang wars in this city are the real deal. In New Orleans, because many lawful citizens are permitted to carry and own guns, they are often taken in robberies. In the US, it's estimated that nearly half a million are stolen every year. With three suspects in custody and two weapons recovered, including a machine gun, the night's work would seem a success. I'm not in no beat. You violate me bad, man. You got me bad. But the challenge of dealing with so many young Nobody people with guns is troubling. Nobody. So calm Thank down. All right? Look around. Look at everybody right now in these cars and in handcuffs. Look at, look at their faces. They're kids. They're children. And you see the hardware that they're carrying out there, the rifles, the guns. That's the frightening thing, yeah. They got no, yeah, they, you know, they pulled the trigger. They, they don't know the consequences, what they're doing. Mm -mm, they don't. And people out there, they're killing each other like crazy, you know? That's the world we live in, you know? That's just how it is right now. It's sad. It's estimated that up to 50% of teenagers drop out of high school across the state, and many turn to crime to get by. They look so innocent when you arrest them, don't they? The only thing you can tell them is death or jail. And guess what? They don't care about either one. Jail is almost like graduating from college for kids out here. It's, 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 it's a pin on their shirt. So they don't care about that. They just go do their time, learn in jail, and come back out and keep doing it. As we leave yet another scene where teenagers have been arrested and weapons recovered, I'm left thinking that the job of Dave and all the cops in New Orleans is one I couldn't deal with day to day. Just like in one night, let alone, you know, one week, the amount of guns that the lads are getting and the amount of guns they have to deal with and that threat, I just find phenomenal. The, the gun situation is out of control. It really is. Well, I mean, I've been doing this 18 years, and I, I, I still sometimes ride around and I just, you know, it, every now and then you just kind of get awestruck with the amount of weapons that you see on the street. This is just a city where young, old, everybody's carrying a gun. Yeah, it's almost like the wild, wild west. It's a hard-hitting final night on patrol with the special ops well, unit. Public cops like Dave and the boys out here. New Orleans is certainly a better place. I've grown to appreciate the tough job they do. To understand it takes a special person to do this day in and day out. So basically, that's our time now up in New Orleans with the, with the SWAT boys and everybody. And uh, I've got to say, it's been really enjoyable. I found that. The longer we've been here, the more they sort of bring you into the group. And um, what's come out of it for me is how tight they are and how they all rely on each other. The shocking side of it all, really, for me, is, is the amount of young kids, you know, 16-year-olds walking about with a gun, you know, full magazine, loaded, ready to go. It, you know, great learning curve and full of excitement, um, great adrenaline rushes on the car chase, especially. You know, you never know if someone's going to run out or anything, you know, and you're doing 100 mile an hour through these little streets. That was quite hairy. You know, it's been a great experience, and it's it, and I think it's taught me uh, to to basically for me to respect the law a lot more. America, a country with some of the most brutal criminals in the world, and fighting back are some of the world's toughest cops. Yeah, he's round the back. I had a shot in there. It's a job where murder, drug wars, and gun crime are part of everyday life. A job where doing your duty could cost you your life. They're running, they're running, they're running! Run! We got one! Now I'm joining some of these cops on the front line in the battle against the bad guys. We got him. Yeah.
For four weeks, I've traveled across America, going to four cities, rolling with some of the country's toughest cops. I've experienced what it's like going on a SWAT raid in Laredo. Come hey, on, boys! There he is. There's one there! There's one there! I've discovered teenage gunmen roaming the streets in New Orleans. You know you shouldn't be having a gun at 16, though. I've trained with the SWAT team in Baltimore. We got him. Yeah. And I've patrolled with the notorious gang unit in Los Angeles. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. I've tasted their highs and felt their lows, and even taken them on in the ring to earn my place in the patrol car. It's been an emotional journey where I've embedded myself with a cop to try to understand what it takes to do this job day in, day out. Sooner or later, they'll end up getting caught. This is my story as I walk the beat with America's toughest cops. In each of the cities I went to, I learned how dangerous it was for the cops on patrol to do their job. Facing down gun-wielding criminals when we stepped out of the car was always tense for me. But I also got to go out with the highly trained cops in each city, the people who the beat cops bring in when they need backup. SWAT or special weapons and tactics are who the cops call when the going gets really tough. I went to the SWAT training ground in Baltimore to speak to the boys and to find out what it takes to become an elite cop. Officer Zach Wine shows me through some of their arsenal. Standard handgun, 40 caliber, we carry a handgun, we have lights on the front. This is a 20 inch shotgun. Yeah, you, I, if you hold them up. 20 you, gauge? 20 inch. Yeah. They're all 12 gauges, but you can see by the yeah, barrel yeah. length Perfect. that you can shoot a little further, a little more distance with this. But as far as like a, an entry weapon, this is a 14 inch. You see how much shorter it is? So when you're going in a house, it's much easier to swing through hallways, but it's going to spread a lot quicker. This is a, a G36. It fires 223 rounds. There's the magazine for it. Holds 30. Um, it's a... Uh, Plastic, huh? Great sound, that, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the SARS then said I could have a go on the range with the SWAT issue machine gun. Just take this over your left shoulder and around your head. There you go. Just like that. Okay. And then I'm sure you've handled a weapon before, so just like that. You have your aim point here. Yep. One click down, semi automatic. So you pull the trigger, it'll just fire one round. Right. Both click down, so if you go all the way down, yep. if you pull the trigger, you hold the trigger back, it'll discharge until, uh, until you're out of ammo, okay. okay? Keep that red dot right in the center of his chest and just pull back nice and slow. And hold the trigger back, that's it, that's it. Now the Sards lets me see how deadly this weapon really is. All right, so go fully automatic, all the way down, one, two. Just hold it to the rear and let it ride, okay? okay. All right, go ahead. Ho oh! ho! There you go. There you go. <laughs> Left it on safe. There you go. Okay, good. Okay. There you go. Thanks. You're very welcome. That was a nice little rush, isn't it? That's yeah, open, I suppose. Isn't it? We got him anyway. Yeah. yeah. Did you? <laughs> very good. Thanks, <laughs> Sergeant. Ah, sure. That's it. There's the. That's what. That's where he said I had to get inside. So is that, I mean, there's one out there, but he got it there. And then this was the semi. Look, yeah, one right there. It's all very well firing at paper targets, but what if I was faced with a real thing? After one day on the training ground, I felt I could handle myself if it got a bit messy. But unfortunately, they wouldn't let me loose with a gun just yet. In Laredo, Texas, on the border with Mexico, we receive a call that the SWAT team were going to raid a home of a jailed Pistolero gang member. I felt ready, but didn't realize how close to the action I was going to get. The Pistoleros control the gun smuggling in Laredo. The police jailed one of its leaders in 2006, Roy Mendoza. They now have a warrant to search his family home for drugs and weapons. Mendoza's son is thought to be living there, although he has no previous convictions. This is Joaquin Romero, the leader of the entry team. He's 31 with eight years' service under his belt. 
When you get there, are you going to give him a chance to come out or are you just going in? No, we're just going hard. Yeah. Uh, we're, me and my team, we're going to tear the gate down. And then after that, everybody's going to make entry through the hole that we make. And then, and then no warning. That no we, warning, just bang. No, yeah, that gives them a chance to get anything that they might have ready. So this, yeah. this is like a hard entry. The real thing, man. So he's just told me that they're basically going to go straight in. No negotiations. They've just said I can go in in the front line with the boys. So the lads that are going in first, hopefully there won't be any shooting. But if there's any shooting, that's when it's going to happen. So uh, I'm going to go in with them and hope this holds up. The surveillance team at the location have given the green light and we're on our way. I'm about to ride in their armoured truck known as the Bearcat. Just so Gazza knows, I've got me pad, Gazza. That's what you should have had, mate, in 87. The Bearcat's job is to destroy the gates at the front of the location. These boys' job is to storm out and put themselves in the firing line and then to make entry into the target house. Right, it's exciting, real exciting. You can tell the boys are buzzing, they're buzzing. Getting close. Getting close now. Woo -hoo. There's a look out there. He's on the phone. There's the Escalade and the red car up there. Short time. We're in it. Go on, boys! Go, 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 go! They're rigging the gates up, they're going to pull the gates up. Here it goes, here goes the gates. Go, 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 mate, go! There it is, there's one there! There's one there! Oh, the car's going, the car's going, look! Down there, they're in. Is he the one we're looking for? One guy here. One guy right here. I think he's a lookout. We've secured the cop. There's firing going on in here. I had a shot in there. They've got everything covered, all the windows. Shit, the adrenaline's unbelievable. Was the guy in the escalator the target? Was he the target? Or was he the target? He's the target. He's the target. So he was already in the car. They jumped out, they hooked up onto the uh, onto the main gate, reverse it out, pulled that out. He's sitting in this truck in the car. So the lookout guy that we passed must have told him. So he was in the car, but we all pulled up. Looks like he's gone to put it in reverse. He's then got out. They see him, get out, he comes running out. The SWAT guy that we was with just went over and just jumped all over him, got him, secured him down. But the car grabbed him out, but the car kept going, so the, the sergeant pulled up behind him and blocked him in and crashed straight into his car. Now it's time to look for drugs and weapons that are allegedly here. Hey, Vinny, the Quest Essential poster for every bad guy's house. Yeah, I got that in my house. <laughs> <laughs> None of mine. Really nice house. You know, if he hasn't got a job, this is unbelievable. We can smell. We can smell marijuana in it. He was a target. Yeah, saw his big tattoo there that we saw in the briefing room. Mendoza, that's his name. You got more DVDs than me, bro. Man, look for yours. I did, there's not there. Did you find it? No. <laughs> I thought you was my pal. There you are, man. <laughs> now I could shake on it. Let me leave you, man. The cops haven't found any guns or drugs. The only shit that I'm going to say, I already knew everything that they were coming. Yeah. It's because they talk too much. Fucking. They, they say, we're going to go and hit this. They talk too, many, too much to their girlfriends. You see? They talk too much to their girlfriends. Yeah. Their girlfriends go and tell their, their 
their daughter, their daughter goes and tells me, and they talk too many shit, so that's how everybody knows. In a small city where word gets around quickly, it's tough for the cops to keep things quiet. On this occasion, Mendoza Jr. is officially charged with resisting arrest, and he has to be released before nightfall. At the time of the filming, his case had yet to go to court. But SWAT isn't all about knocking down doors and throwing flashbang grenades. In Baltimore, the SWAT situation didn't call for an aggressive approach. This guy's barricaded himself in up this side street. They reckon he's got a machete and a gun. He's uh, done time in Vietnam. He's about 60 years old. And there's Ezzy Armour car there. You can just see the SWAT guys here up the side. Come in. Hey, uh, we want to move out of, out of line of sight altogether. If he has a long rifle, you want to be out of line of sight so he can't, can't shoot you. Can't shoot somebody, yeah. Wow. Well, especially you, yeah. <laughs> but he might not have liked my films, John. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he wants an autograph. The negotiators move in, backed up by the SWAT team. The amazing thing is, they've just gone there now, them boys, and they're in full lock and load mode to shoot this guy. I wouldn't like to be that geezer now, I'll tell you that. After four hours of negotiations and failing to persuade the suspect to leave the house, SWAT command try another method, tear gas. We're about 60 yards away and they've put the tear gas in there. It's horrible, right, right, gets right in your throat, makes you sneeze. I don't know how he's still in there. The tear gas has forced a man to give up, and the siege comes to an end. In Baltimore, I learned that SWAT isn't just all about gun ho aggression. Negotiating is often the cop's best tactic. He seems a tough bastard, though, doesn't he? Really? He's got cuts and bruises everywhere. They just said to him, you all right? He said, well, I'm breathing. I've been rolling with some of America's toughest cops in four cities across the country. Drugs were a problem wherever I went. It felt like every time we arrested someone or we were called to a crime scene, narcotics were somehow involved. It's estimated that across the United States, an average of 68% of people arrested test positive for drugs. In New Orleans, the challenge for the police comes from those who will try anything to evade capture. I was riding with Officer John Barbetti, patrolling the streets of one of its toughest neighborhoods, when the car up ahead refused to stop. He's running. We've got a runner. We've got a runner. We're traveling at nearly 100 miles now, but still the suspect's car ahead is leaving us in a cloud of dust. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, we're chasing a car right now. Um, he's running from the police. Just gotta watch these intersections. Bro, bro. It's so dusty, we can't see a lot. Up ahead, the suspect's car turns right, so John takes an earlier route, and we see if we can head him off. As we wait for the car to emerge, the chasing unit radio, and they tell us that the wanted men have crashed, and they're now on foot. Is he running, John? Yeah, he's on foot. This, he's right out here someplace. Keep an eye on behind us. Yeah. 5400 block. He's looking at 5400 block. I scaled the houses looking for a sign of the two suspects. There, there across the road. Yeah. Just ahead, I spot one of them running in front of us, and he's heading into the bushes. He's in the rear yard. In there, huh? Yeah, he cut across. He's on Royal, Royal. 2100, going toward back toward St. Claude. Stop, back up, go back! Come here! Get down! Get down! Get down! With Barbetti in the bushes chasing the suspect, someone needs to get round the side and head him off. Yeah, he's round the back. Somebody need to call out the name. What it was. You got him back there? Thankfully, another unit is there to tackle him down. Otherwise, I'd have notched up my first takedown. What other way, man? Go hey, 
the way. Which street are we on? Right. Hey, we right now, we're between Royal and... Oof, that was the real stuff. John just said to me, keep an eye out behind. I look behind, I just see him run across the street behind us. When he was going so fast, any little kids, anything, yeah, they just killed him. You got seconds. him? <laughs> they got the one, yeah. Yeah, we flushed it. The one we still were coming. I saw him, I couldn't get back to that fence fast enough. I got, I got wailed in the face with a tree branch. I just saw him out of the corner of my eye, just running across like, the street. I was a good one. I said, I looked back and I saw you say, I was looking at him. <laughs> it was later revealed that the suspect yeah, and his accomplice gone. had dumped the stash of marijuana after crushing. The suspects were lucky to escape uninjured after the chase, and it was all over a small bag of weed and a stolen car. You make you nervous? It's estimated that 20% of all inmates in US jails committed their offense to obtain money for drugs. I learned that they go to any lengths to prevent the police from catching them with their stash, even when the amounts are small. In Los Angeles, the street dealers have learned another way to evade arrest when the police approach. I was on patrol with Sergeant Ron Lopez when one of the accompanying units spotted something suspicious. Two young gang members are selling drugs on a street corner. For these guys, the day's business is over. Chris and Steve have come around the corner, two lads on the thing here, probably lookouts, bolted in here, so they've stopped running after them. This kid and this other kid were around the side here. And as they saw the cops, he's gone bosh and smashed it into his mouth. And they tried to get him down and get that out like that. But in his desperation, the juvenile has swallowed his stash of crack. I think they're about to call the paramedics now because he's 13 and he's swallowed it. So it's now turned into a major incident now. Yeah, he just told us he swallowed uh, rock cocaine. He won't tell us how much, though. He said he swallowed a baggie, but he won't, he's not sure how much is in there. He, uh, he's admitted that he's took it now, but um, he still won't tell them how much. Normally, adults can handle it, but it depends on the quantity they swallow. It can have a pretty adverse, make them pretty sick. The cops can't take any chances, and so the boy is taken to hospital in handcuffs as his surprised father looks on. Hey, you swallow some dope? I take that look away as uh, an admission of guilt. My son ain't swallowing no dope. I don't care what you say, you can take it to the officer or whatever, but I know my son ain't swallowing no fucking drugs. Put your hands up. His dad came out there. He said to him, you swallow dope, you swallow dope, and he can't even answer his dad. He just looked away, which is so sad. You know, you can see the situation we're in here. <laughs> which ain't the best. He's already involved, 14 years old, you know. Daddy. So, um, we made this you know, up he's too. a victim of the gangs, you know, Daddy. and uh, hopefully if he gets a stomach Any angle you pump, put the camera he won't do it again. So uh, we'll go on anyway. It was scary to see the lengths that these kids were going to not to be arrested. But I was also learning what a challenge it was for the cops to deal with this level of drug crime. It's seen that to prevent this problem on America's streets, the supply needed to be cut. In Laredo, Texas, the drugs are in transit to the lucrative city markets. The drugs that are smuggled across the border first go to stash house before being moved north to the marketplace. Sheriff's cop Jesse Jimenez was on the scene when one's busted in East Laredo. We discovered some uh, five kilos of uh, cocaine and a little bit of marijuana. The undercover work has led the cops to a big score. These drugs won't be making it to any street dealers. That is cocaine. Each one of these squares is approximately 2.2 .2 pounds, a uh, kilo, kilo of cocaine. Street value? Uh, here in uh, Laredo, it's about 15,000, 15,000 a kilo. And upstate can be, or up north, in other northern states can be anywhere from 30 to 45,000 a kilo. He had it on top of the, of the pantry. Usually they've been sent out from cartels in Mexico. That is marijuana. 
That's marijuana. You're looking at roughly maybe seven to ten pounds of marijuana. That was found up in the attic. Just verifying Two. to see if it's uh, okay. I'm gonna take it back to the, and uh, test those packages to see if uh, it tests positive for uh, narcotics. Yeah, it definitely feels good. Taking uh, drugs up the street feels good. The US government spends over $20 billion every year on the war against drugs. And one person is arrested for violating drug laws every 17 seconds. In Baltimore, drug-related offenses are directly linked to over two-thirds of crime in the city. When I was on patrol, I spotted something kicking off. Oh, 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 fine. Yeah. I just saw I just saw this guy grab him and just smash him. Yes. What's going on? He's I'm the bad. father. I'm the father. Okay. He's got a warrant on him in Baltimore County okay. for breaking into my business. Okay. Today he decided to break in my house and he you stole go? my truck. A fifty thousand dollar truck. You have anything on you that I should know about? You got a need. Oh man, if you do, we're gonna find it anyway, so it won't make any harm. Why are you taking your dad's truck? I have a heroin addiction. He's jacked out his head. They're saying that he's he's wanted in uh, another county. In Essex, I heard that. And here, actually, what the what the guys are saying is he hasn't actually done anything here to arrest him for. He stole from my house today. I understand it's in Hartford County, though. There's no way you can detain him. It seems to me that what this kid needs is help, but his dad is intent on getting him locked up. I want to know why he feels that jail is the only way to sort his son out. You know, that... jail's no good for him. He, you know, he's got all them right. things. He's gonna, you know, if you, you know, he's gonna die. I, gonna look, die. I know it, man. It's my kid. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to have to put him in jail. But you know what? At least I know where he is and he's safe. He's got a chance. He's got a chance like in jail. He don't have a chance. He don't, I tried telling him before. So, I mean, he's a good hearted kid, but you know what? This drugs are killing him. This, this Let's is kill him. And it's such a shame. Yeah, I know. And you know what? It's out of control down there. It's off the hook in Baltimore. You pick the right place to come find the violence. The thing is that you got money. With no grounds to hold the young man, the police encourage his father to take control of the situation. They're going to release you to me. I'm putting you in Bill's truck and yanking out because we're locking you in the back. Sick of living like this. Okay, I understand you're sick of living like this, but every time I try to get you help, you don't want it. The father now says he simply wants to take his son uh, to the nearest hospital, hopefully to get him some treatment for his addiction. Uh, his son says uh, he'll be happy to do that, and that's where we are now. Hopefully, he'll go and get him some treatment. That would be a big plus. I've been on a journey across America, rolling with the cops who tackle crime in four of America's toughest cities. Out on SWAT duty, I experience the adrenaline that these boys taste every time they go on a raid. But I also learned how difficult it is dealing with the crimes caused by drugs. But it wasn't difficult to pin the blame for most of the crime on the gangsters who control the trade. And in South Central LA, the gangs are notorious. L.A. is home to two of the most infamous gangs in the world, the Bloods and the Crips. And their main business is the drug trade. The Bloods and the Crips are the city's black gangs. Added into the mix are the numerous Hispanic gangs. In the last 25 years, more than 10,000 gang members have been killed. The highest concentration of gang activity in the city is in the notorious 77th district. And that's where I'm headed. I'm going to be riding with Sergeant Ron Lopez deep into the heart of the 77th District gangland. Some gang members who are on parole have been spotted drinking at house party and they're breaking the conditions of their release. We know there's gang members in the party that are uh, on probation and parole. They're not supposed to be uh, hanging out together. It might not sound dangerous, but it's a potential tinderbox situation that could escalate into something far bigger. Other reason for breaking up gang parties is that it allows rival gangs to have a, a good target. 
A few blocks away, the cops plan their raid on the gathering. On the uh, southwest corner, there's a lookout out there. He's dressed in black, the black cap on. So you know, he's, we've been seeing him up and down the street all night just driving around, so. We're going to jam everybody up and put them all against the east side of the, uh, the building. They're not taking any chances. All right, saddle up. Every actor should have one of these. If everybody's still there, pertaining the information we got during the little briefing right now, yeah. should be a, a pretty good hit. A lot of drinking, a lot of booze, a lot of uh, drugs, possible guns. All of the above are uh, very likely in uh, a situation like this. Um, what our guys will be paying specific attention for is uh, that one or two guys that try to make a break for it on the, uh, the back side of the group. Uh, the potential would be very dangerous. The boys seem quite keyed up for it. They like all this, do they? They affectionately refer to it as smashing. Yeah. And so, uh, we're going to go smash a party. So. As we get closer, we kill the lights. I'm going to uh, throw the light. And then hit the gas. <laughs> The party goes are lined up as the cops search the location for drugs and guns. But they find nothing, and the gang members they were looking for seem to have slipped off into the night. They had surveillance that there was a few gang members there that they wanted to round up, but they think maybe the, the boys they were after slipped out. So, uh, it's a bit of after Lord Mayor's show a little bit. So we'll move on anyway. For the cops, controlling crowds is an important skill, but sometimes people don't want to play ball, and when that happens, they need to be subdued. In Baltimore, Detective Donnie Moses and Officer Dave White got a call to help out some colleagues who were in a difficult situation. Guy inside the house tearing the house up, um, wrecking the house, and he has a knife with him. The officers are on their way to a domestic disturbance where a young man is threatening his parents. <laughs> Statewide this year alone, there have been 42 fatal shootings within family homes. Stay on my hip, on my hip. The young man is in the kitchen and still arguing, when without warning... The cops can't calm him down, so they decide to use an alternative measure. Back up, back up, back up. Stop him, Kyle. All right, you uh, turn over. Turn over, turn over. Turn over. They use a taser to stun the suspect. It shoots two hooked wires into the man's flesh, sending a 50,000 volt charge through his body. It will take the suspect several minutes to recover. Although it looks like rough justice, using a taser has brought the problem under control and allows the officers to secure the young man safely. All right, 35, uh, we have the individual in our custody. No officers injured. Young man apparently was giving his family members a problem. Uh, when we tried to gain control of him, tried to talk him out of his rage, it didn't appear to work. Ultimately, we had to tase him. Less, less than lethal use of force. Uh, once we tased him, we handcuffed him, it's over. The ambulance came and checked the individual out to make sure that he didn't have any life-threatening uh, injuries. Then from there, right now, we're going to transport him to uh, probably the local hospital. They have to take the prongs 
that were discharged from the uh, taser. They have to take that out of his back and check his vitals. And then from there, he's going to be uh, sent over to our centralized booking. That's where we process all prisoners. So he's going to be charged with uh, uh, assault on police officers. According to the makers, 170,000 suspects are tasered across the US every year. As a non-lethal response and an alternative to the gun, it's a no-brainer for the cops. Armed with a taser, they are less likely to have to use lethal force. But in New Orleans, they faced a lot of people who were in possession of firearms, and it felt much more dangerous. For my last night in the city, I was riding with Officer Dave Duplantier. All right, turn it right on. As we drive through the city, Dave receives an urgent call and the lights go on. Talk to me, where you at? What was that, bro? They got a guy running on foot that boarded on him. Uh, they got a little 75. The worst call a cop can get is to hear a fellow if officer is down man. or struggling with a suspect because he knows to get away, he will use any means. Right now they got a uh, they got a fight going on. With some officers? Yeah, they got some officers involved. You good? Everybody good? When we arrive, the area is flooded with cops to patrol the situation, and three suspects have been apprehended. I'm told that as the officers went to apprehend the suspects, a gun was pulled, and after a brief struggle, it was thrown into a nearby alleyway. The number of units is justified as this street corner is at the center of a gang war. The suspects arrested are thought to be gang members, armed and ready to protect their turf. After checking the rear of the property, Dave makes an alarming discovery. Uh, poor man's version of a Benelli, huh? The gang had hidden a laser-sighted semi-automatic machine gun in the back garden. A sign that beefs or gang wars in this city are the real deal. In New Orleans, because many lawful citizens are permitted to carry and own guns, they are often taken in robberies. In the US, it's estimated that nearly half a million are stolen every year. With three suspects in custody, and two weapons recovered, including a machine gun, the night's work would seem a success. I'm not in no beef. You violate me bad, man. You got me bad. But the challenge of dealing with so many young people with guns is troubling. Nobody. Look around, look at everybody right now in these cars and in handcuffs. Look at, look at their faces. They're kids. They're children. And you see the hardware that they're carrying out there, the rifles, the guns. That's the frightening thing, yeah. They got no, yeah, they, you know, they pull the trigger. They, they don't know the consequences, what they're doing. Mm -mm, they don't. And people out there, they're killing each other like crazy, you know? That's the world we live in, you know? That's just how it is right now. Say it. It's estimated that up to 50% of teenagers drop out of high school across the state, and many turn to crime to get by. They look so innocent when you arrest them, don't they? The only thing you can tell them is death or jail. And guess what? They don't care about either one. Jail is almost like... Graduating from college for kids out here, it's, 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 it's a pin on their shirt. So they don't care about that. They just go do their time, learn in jail, and come back out and keep doing it. As we leave yet another scene where teenagers have been arrested and weapons recovered, I'm left thinking that the job of Dave and all the cops in New Orleans is one I couldn't deal with day to day. Just like in one night, let alone, you know, one week, the amount of guns that the lads are getting and the amount of guns they have to deal with and that threat, I just find phenomenal. The, the gun situation is out of control. It really is. This is just a city where young, old, everybody's carrying a gun. Yeah, it's no. almost like the wild, wild west. It was heart-wrenching to see so many young kids feeling the need to go around with such firepower. In each city I went to, I saw how young the criminals involved in the crime business were, and I couldn't help feeling that at such a young age that they were also victims. But I also met some that didn't deserve my sympathy. Having rolled with some of America's toughest cops, I've discovered how difficult their job really is. 
but I also spoke to some of the suspects and criminals who had either been arrested or jailed. You know you shouldn't be having a gun at 16, eh? Here I learned that sometimes the innocent faces hit a much darker side. I mean, a lot of the armed robberies and stuff like that, and even nowadays, the murders, the perpetrators are getting younger and younger. In Laredo, I went to the top security county jail, which was full to the brim with gang members who had been involved in the cross-border smuggling trade. Commander Juan Hernandez is in charge of this jail. He's going to introduce me to the prisoners. But first, I want to know what I'm up against. Uh, what are the dangers, then? The danger to you may be that, uh, that they're in jail for murder and things like that, and, you know, putting a name in their, a feather in their cap by, uh, by uh, you know, striking a known person may be something that they won't think twice about. You OK? Yeah. Let's go out there. He's scary enough, I don't like the others. The commander's told me that the man I'm going to meet has committed murder for the cartels. How you doing? How long, how long have you got to do? Right now? Yeah. How much am I going to do? 55. 55? 55. I'm not going to ask why. <laughs> Man. Yeah, they gave him 55 years and 50 running for How long have you done? Right now, uh, it's November 2007. 2007? Yeah. Two years? Yeah, more than two years. Do they mean anything, your tattoos? Your tattoos? Yeah. Uh, only this one. What does this one mean? Uh, again, the Texas Syndicate. That's your gang? Yeah. Are you, are you everybody in that? Is uh, everybody in the same gang? No, it's all just friends. Just friends? Yeah. Yeah, we got, they got to put the same people in the same tank. Oh, they have to? Yeah. Oh, because you know, you'd be? No, nah, we don't be. We, we peace and everything, but they just for the own race the people. So they separate everybody. Yeah. Well, wish you all the best, man. All right. And the Mexican Mafia are probably the toughest, but the Pistoleros, they're the gun boys. They're actually the gun runners. But, um, we just we were just talking in there and he said the meanest of the mean the baddest of the bad of this big area are in here under his watchful eye coming face to face with a cartel member in jail was nerve-wracking this unassuming criminal is a convicted murderer responsible for overseeing the flood of drugs and guns into the united states a business that is estimated to earn the mexican cartels 25 billion dollars a year in Los Angeles, I got to meet the gang members at the other end of the drug distribution chain. And here they looked much more intimidating. What's that shit? It's not too difficult for the cops to spot gang members, as they are easily identifiable from their tattoos. Although some are in the most unusual places. Aaron just got put on, so he's uh, tattooed his eyelids. That's brand new. What do you get that done? Mm, I can't tell you. Well, this week. Let's say six, seven. And what does that mean? Neighborhood crew. How many times have you been shot? I don't even know. I lost count. But it's bullet holes every fucking where. Look, 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 look at the uh, look at the telephone. Look at the cars. Why not? But it's cool though. I don't even want them to find them if I get killed. I don't care. Is that a dangerous place to live? Hell yeah, it's the most dangerous place on earth. If you truly want to disconnect, you can. You can go get your gang tattoos removed, or you can get them covered up, and you can change your lifestyle if you choose to do it. Um, but as long as you're in the neighborhood and you're still dressing and wearing the colors and flying your tattoos, then you're not out of the game, no matter what you say. But when your face is covered with them, that's easier said than done. I've come to a project called Home Voice, which for many of these gang members is a way out from life on the streets. The project gives gang members the opportunity to rehabilitate themselves, which includes a free tattoo removal service. These people just come in, but what, what, anybody off the street can just um, walk anyone, in? Anyone, yeah, anyone off the street can come in. If your tattoos are gang-related and they're, like, on your face, 
front of your neck or your head, you know, you're obviously a walking target. So we try to get you in as soon as we can. Even if you were to stop by today, we'll try to get you in today. I'll have to get around to it, won't I? Yeah, think about it. <laughs> today, gang member Ishmael de Santiago is in the chair. The ink is lasered out of his skin in a process which has been described as like having hot fat hit in your face. Stay in there, bro. The body can only take so much sometimes. The laser sends short pulses of light into the top layers of the skin. The energy breaks the ink into small pieces, which are later naturally removed by the body's immune system. Tattoos are painful going on. It's even worse taking them off. <laughs> Go on, bro. What you're doing, man, is a massive thing. I really applaud you, honestly, big time. What, what, what is this? What is the gang? London. Is that a big? Big organisation? Ah, um, it's all right, you know. Well, they say to you, what are you doing? They're probably get disappointed, you know, but... Well, I mean, you just got to say, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. The only time I see them is when I come to prison, but that's something I don't You done to... with prison now? I just got out like three weeks ago, so... Good for you, man. Wish you all the best, man. Thank you. All right, stick so the next door, they'll bandage you up, and then they give you some... Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, next time. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. It's a take. Tats off your face is, I mean, the pain is ridiculous, you know? And uh, I just, you know, commend them for that. And that is the loveliest thing what I've been getting from here today is they're starting, he says, start my new life. You know, they're starting again, so it's fantastic. It's been an eye opening four weeks for me on the road with the cops in Laredo, Baltimore, New Orleans, and LA. I've seen them putting their lives on the line for the good of the people they serve. I've discovered that the criminals are often young kids with not much to lose who are caught in the drug trade. It's been an emotional ride for me, one that I couldn't deal with day to day, but one that comes naturally to America's toughest cops. America, a country with some of the most brutal criminals in the world, and fighting back are some of the world's toughest cops. Yeah, he's round the back. It's a job where murder, drug wars, and gun crime are part of everyday life. A job where doing your duty could cost you your life. They're running, they're running, they're running! Run! We got one! Now I'm joining some of these cops on the front line in the battle against the bad guys. We got him. Yeah. Laredo, Texas. This is the real Wild West. Mexico's just a stone's throw across the Rio Grande. It's bandit country, where drug cartels rule with fear and bloody violence. The danger is that saying the wrong thing to the wrong person may get him killed. I want to learn how the crime gangs make billions from this border and experience what it takes to stop them. You just never, never know who you're running after, so you just got to be prepared for anything. What it's like being a cop on America's front line. Let's go, King. I'm going to saddle up with the law officers who are waging this war on crime. They are the Laredo Police, the Sheriff's Department, and the United States Border Patrol. Their mission is to protect the border and keep the vicious cartel out of town. Laredo is in South Texas. It's an international border city with its four bridges acting as checkpoints coming into the USA. In the 60s, it was the poorest city in America. And although it's now the second fastest growing city, the average wage is still only 150 pound a week. Millionaires are created from the legal import-export trade here, but it's the illegal trade that makes billions. The cartels smuggle drugs and people into the USA and don't think twice about killing to protect their profit. The Laredo citizens have been caught in the crossfire. 
It's straight yeah. down to business. I want to see how the police deal with the city's drug problem. At Laredo's police headquarters, the SWAT Special Weapons and Tactics Unit have a search warrant for the family home of a jailed Pistolero gang member. The tip-off here is that the uh, target house is under surveillance. Right now, they're going over situational information in this room. As soon as we uh, finish with that briefing, we'll be headed right to the scene. And what do you expect is uh, at the house? What's the, what's the rumor? We understand that our, there's firearms inside the house. OK, let's do it. The Pistoleros control the gun smuggling in Laredo. The police jailed one of its leaders in 2006, Roy Mendoza. How you doing? They now have a warrant to search his family home for drugs and weapons. Mendoza's son is thought to be living there, although he has no previous convictions. I join the briefing as the teams are being given up-to-date intelligence on their mission. I don't know if he pays them or not, but he has people hanging around the truck. He drives a white Lincoln Navigator, but we've also seen a red uh, Toyota. The surveillance team have done their job. There he is. That's our target, Mendoza Jr. The house has a real connection to a dangerous criminal element. I can feel the team's adrenaline building steadily. This is Joaquin Romero, the leader of the entry team. He's 31 with eight years' service under his belt. When you get there, you're going to give him a chance to come out, or are you just going in? No, we're just going hard. Uh, we're, me and my team, we're going to tear the gate down. And then after that, everybody's going to make entry through the hole that we make. And then there's no warning. That no we, warning, just bang. No, yeah, that gives them a chance to get anything that they might have ready. So this, yeah. this is like a hard entry. So. The real thing, man. So he's just told me that they're basically going to go straight in. No negotiations. They've just said I can go in in the front line with the boys. So the lads that are going in first, hopefully there won't be any shooting. But if there's any shooting, that's when it's going to happen. So uh, I'm going to go in with them and hope this holds up. The surveillance team at the location have given the green light and we're on our way. I'm about to ride in their armoured truck known as the Bearcat. Just so Gazza knows, I've got me pad, Gazza. That's what you should have had, mate, in 87. Do you expect gunfire? They're really in here. No training can substitute this, eh? No, sir. We take the lead, and there's no turning back now. Heat is unbelievable. <laughs> I don't know how he's got a bat of glove, right? Yeah, it's only like 110 degrees. The Bearcat's job is to destroy the gates at the front of the location. These boys' job is to storm out and put themselves in the firing line, then make entry into the target house. Right, it's exciting, real exciting. You can tell the boys are buzzing, they're buzzing. It's getting close now. Gates up. They're gonna pull the gates up. Here it goes, here goes the gates. There's one there. There's one there. Oh, the car's going, the car's going, look. Oh fuck it. We've got the car there, we've got this car down there, they're in. Is he the one we're looking for? One guy here. One guy right here. I think he's a lookout. We've secured the cop. There's firing going on in here. I had a shot in there. They've got everything covered, all the windows. Shit, the adrenaline's unbelievable. Anyone in there? Uh, I don't know yet. So far, I don't think they found anybody. Was the guy in the escalator the target? Was he the target? Or was he still at? He's the target. So he was already in the car. Con madre. 
Está bien? Sí, ahí está, no, ahí está. What kind of surprises are popping out of that navigator? Yeah. Did you grab him? Was yeah. it you wrestled him down? Yeah. The entry teams are clearing through every room in the house to guarantee there's no surprise shootout. This was his car, he was in this navigator when he jumped out to go. They blocked him in here. They jumped out, they hooked up onto the, uh, onto the main gate, reversed it out, pulled that out. He's sitting in this truck in the car. So the lookout guy that we passed must have told him. So he was in the car, but we all pulled up. Looks like he's gone to put it in reverse. He's then got out, they see him, get out, he comes running out. The SWAT guy that we was with just went over and just jumped all over him, got him, secured him down. But the car, he grabbed him out, but the car kept going. So the, the sergeant pulled up behind him and blocked him in and crashed straight into his car. When they arrested him, put the handcuffs on him, he didn't seem too bothered, I'll tell you. Whether they'd moved it already, what, I don't know. But uh, the adrenaline, I, you know, I was shaking with the adrenaline, it was great. I'm just glad that they didn't come out shooting, you know? I'd have had to, show, I'd, I'd have had to throw my cell phone at them. They didn't give me no guns, they give me this, so. I'm in Laredo, Texas, where the cops are trying to prevent Mexican cartels and local gangs from seizing control of the city. The SWAT unit are carrying out a warrant on the home of a jailed gang member. Now it's time to look for drugs and weapons that are allegedly here. The entry teams retreat and let the other cops get on with searching for evidence. Hey, Vinny, the quintessential poster for every bad guy's house. Yeah, I got that in my house. <laughs> 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 this is the scales and the Ziploc bags, look. So I don't really want to touch them in case people come in. Yeah. They're gonna, they're, everyone's gonna come in and search everything. Okay, none of mine. Yeah. Really nice house. You know, if he hasn't got a job, this is unbelievable. We can smell. Night you can smell so marijuana in it. Yeah. He was a target, yeah. Saw his big tattoo there that we saw in the briefing room. Mendoza, that's his name. I want to see what Mr. Mendoza Jr. is really all about. You talk English? Who are you? From England. I do some movies, yeah. You're, I think you're going to be in the movies now as well. <laughs> well I've got nothing but a gun. Can you come out in the 60 seconds? Yeah, I've done that one, yeah. Okay. They've all I seen have... that. You haven't got 60 seconds in your collection? Yeah. You I have? <laughs> nice what? house, man. Oh, my dad's. Is it? I like the marble. Oh, the floor? Yeah, nice. My dad said it cost a lot, but... They've tipped the house upside down, but so far found nothing they can pin on him. Oh, uh, baggie of marijuana, but it's just. I can still smell it. <laughs> the sniffer dog can only find empty bags, and I spot what the cops are up against. That's his own surveillance. They're watching the police, the police are watching them. Shows it there, look, he's got four different views of the outside. I knew these were coming. Watch it, man. Finally, the guys check his last possible hiding place. Squad, man. No. You got more DVDs than me, bro. Man, look for yours. I did. There's not there. Did you find it? No. <laughs> I thought you was my pal. There you are, man. <laughs> now I could shake on it. This time, the cops haven't found any guns or drugs. The only shit that I'm going to say, I already knew everything that they were coming. Yeah. It's because they talk too much. Fucking... They, they say, we're going to go and hit this. They talk too, many, too much to their girlfriends. You see? They talk too much to their girlfriends. Yeah. Their girlfriends go and tell their... their their daughter, the daughter goes and tells me, and they talk too many shit, so that's how everybody knows.
This is his dad's house. His dad's uh, in prison as one of the head of the Pistoleros. Um, Pistoleros are probably one of the worst gangs because they're gun related. Uh, they're gun dealers mainly. He knew they were coming, mate, and uh, whatever was here, ain't here no more. And there was definitely some stuff on the scales, some white powder on scales in there. But uh, so I had the boys are splitting out now, and it, it's a real downer. I mean, the, the adrenaline, and everything. Oh, you know, shaking with adrenaline earlier on, and now it's you know the storm settled and calmed down. Being here with them, actually in the action like that, it just shows the intensity. You know, I mean. That was like us going out and playing football on a Saturday. They were all buzzing, they were hyped up for it. They'll settle down now and hopefully have a glass of beer. And... But uh, we'll move on anyway. On this occasion, Mendoza Jr. is officially charged only with resisting arrest and has to be released before nightfall. His case has yet to go to court. In a small city where word gets around quickly, it's tough for the cops to keep things quiet. Investigator Joe Baeza was the officer who hooked me up with the SWAT unit. He's been fighting crime in Laredo for 10 years. We will do whatever it takes to, to maintain stability and safety in our community and also for the rest of the United States. Uh, the buck definitely stops here. Joe is patrolling one of Laredo's busiest entry points from Mexico into the USA, the World Trade Bridge. The cartels, the drug pushers, they all use this great veil, this great forest of, of truck traffic to hide their narcotics going into the United States. If we rest, uh, they win. And people's lives are changed because of it. Around $10 million worth of drugs cross over the four bridges in Laredo every day. It's a constant battle and a massive task for a small force. It calls for complete dedication. Uh, the cost at times is, is the ultimate sacrifice. You have to be a little crazy to be in this work. I would say that we have a take no prisoners attitude, but that's exactly contradictory that what we do here. We take as many prisoners as possible. The overall majority of all the officers are on patrol, all have long rifles. Uh, they carry AR-15s, M16s, uh, Colt 9mm submachine guns, and uh, they're very efficiently and thoroughly trained to use those firearms. The drug cartels and narco terrorists are killing at will over the border in Mexico. There's a war of terror being waged across, where if you behead two people, well, the next guy has to come back and behead four. This deadly crime wave is so out of control that the Mexican government has had to call in the army to protect its people. The criminals never, never will take control of the country. In Texas, anyone can buy a gun, but in Mexico, it's against the law. So guns are trafficked one way and drugs and people the other. $11 million worth of cocaine and three tons of marijuana were seized in just one weekend. It's all out slaughter in Mexico. The cops here in Laredo fight to prevent that lawlessness from coming into the USA. I'm going on patrol with hotshot cop Jesse Jimenez from the Sheriff's Department to discover how all the trafficking works. Fits you just fine. OK. We're patrolling Route 83. It runs parallel with the Mexican border for 150 miles. It's an infamous smuggling highway. A couple of months ago, we received some information that they were storing 20 tons of marijuana on the Mexican side, ready to get crossed. 20 tons? Ready to cross. Vinny, these guys will try anything, anything in every which way to smuggle their narcotics, and they always end up getting caught. Sooner or later, they'll end up getting caught. We'll definitely get something tonight. I'll we'll definitely get something tonight. 7-3, kind of B-10-8. Check that room. 
was soon called as backup to another incident just up the highway. Two passengers and a driver have been stopped. The officers are checking their stories as we arrive on the scene. Do they know the driver? They claim they do. They claim that they've known the driver for a long time. They've got no idea on them? Uh, I don't believe so, or Mexican ID. I know that they got conflicting stories. Usually, that's a good indicator of something that's going on illegally. Jess is saying these two are illegal. Uh, they're going to be taken into custody by Border Patrol right now. They have no uh, resident alien cards or paperwork to be here in the US legally. Laredo is a honeypot for illegal activity. By constantly watching the highways, the officers try to tackle the problem as soon as it reaches the American soil. It's half eight at night and still about 100 degrees. But there's no stopping now for Jesse. He's just got the call for a raid on a suspected drug stash house. All the officers are gathering at a nearby parking lot and they wait for the order to move in. Our CI just made contact with the target house. Confidential informant just made uh, contact, so we want to verify to see if the narcotics is still in the house so we can go and uh, have consent to search. It's confirmed. Two suspects have been spotted at the target house and the boys roll out immediately to make the arrest. We're here already. Let's dismount. Let's go. As soon as the cops arrive, the suspects burst out of the target house and make a run for it. They're running! They're running! They're running! They're running! They're running! Run! Watch out! Watch out! Watch out! Watch out! They're running towards the riverbank. Running towards the riverbanks. The Mexican border means freedom for the suspects, and it's just two miles away. You went in here. Check underneath the trailer. You got him? Where's he at? Where's he at? He's underneath the bed. Mason! 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 Yo! We got one! Where's the little camisa blanca? Get him up. Let's go. This first man is led away for questioning when a neighbor gives Jesse the wink that our other suspect might be nearby. Still searching for the other subject. The other subject was wearing a white shirt, white t shirt with a. With the border so close, the subject has nothing to gain by giving himself up, but everything to gain if he makes it across the river. Miles from here. Yeah, that's probably why they thought about it. He said, we might as well try to hide. You don't know if he's behind a, the wall waiting for you with a, hand, a gun in hand and, uh, you know, ready to shoot at you whenever you come uh, around the corner. So, so always keep your weapon raised. The other officers couldn't find any drugs in the location. The man under arrest is an illegal Mexican immigrant. He will be sent straight back to Mexico. Running after somebody, it's, it's a, a adrenaline rush. You don't know really who you're running after. You can be running after one of the drug cartels or one of the members or a hitman or somebody who just committed murder. I mean, you just never, never know who you're running after, so you just got to be prepared for anything. 
Policing here means dealing with the constant threat of armed criminals. The heat can be stupefying, but that threat keeps the cops alert at all times. I'm on the US border with Mexico. Even at sunset here on the Rio Grande, it's around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I've come to the city of Laredo to learn how the police are tackling border crime here. With drugs and illegal immigrants streaming over the border every day, it's a full-on task. I'm now out on the night patrol with Deputy David Nemke. We've just pulled a guy over for alleged drunk driving, but he's got more trouble in store. A bit of cocaine on the seat. Yeah, yeah. Could be coke on the seat. I miss. Uh huh. They think it's a drunk driver. Got Budweiser in there on the side there. And there. Box of, there's a box of Budweiser's in the back there as well. If there's coke, what happens? You just make sure it matches that. It should match pink over blue like that, and that means it's positive. Okay. He's going to jail. Drugs that are smuggled across the border end up in stash houses and Deputy Jesse Jimenez is on the scene when one's busted in East Laredo. After a surveillance team identified the target, it was Jesse who arrested him by tackling him in his own backyard. We discovered some uh, five kilos of uh, cocaine, a little bit of marijuana. The undercover work has led cops to a big score. These drugs won't be making it to any street dealers. That is cocaine. Each one of these squares is approximately 2.2 .2 pounds, a uh, kilo, kilo of cocaine. Street value? Uh, here in uh, Laredo, it's about 15,000, 15,000 a kilo. And upstate can be, or up north, in other northern states can be anywhere from 30 to 45,000 a kilo. You add it on top of the, of the pantry. Usually they've been sent out from cartels in Mexico. That is marijuana. That's marijuana. You're looking at roughly maybe seven to ten pounds of marijuana. That was found up in the attic. The word is there might be five more kilos in the house, so the boys continue the search. While Jesse heads into the attic, Captain Ted Garcia investigates a child's bedroom. We found a 22 caliber rifle with a scope. What we look for are the semi-automatic and the uh, handguns. And some of those either go into Mexico or they're used for local crimes. So that's what we try to seize. Just verifying to, to see if it's uh, okay. No joy with the extra stash. So Jesse bags up the evidence. I'm going to take it back to the, and uh, test those packages to see if uh, it tests positive for uh, narcotics. Yeah, it definitely feels good. Taking uh, drugs up the street feels good. The radar is being flooded with the Mexican cartel's drug loads. I want to find out who's working for these cartels. It's time to meet some of these gang members face to face. I'm off to Laredo's top security jail. It's full to the brim with gang members, smugglers, and killers. Hopefully, we're going to go in and speak to one of the inmates, find out what he's done. And and all that stuff, you know, just have a chat with him. But uh, it's a little bit off the cuff at the moment, so we'll see. Just hope you don't take me as a hostage, I think. That's true, man. Commander Juan Hernandez is in charge of this jail. He's going to introduce me to the prisoners. But first, I want to know what I'm up against. Uh, what are the dangers, then? Well, the dangers is that saying the wrong thing to the wrong person may get him killed. Yeah. Uh, the danger to you may be that uh, that they're in jail for murder and things like that, and you know, putting a name in their a feather in their cap by uh, by uh, you know striking a known person may be something that they won't think twice about. You okay? Yeah. Let's go out there. He's scary enough, I don't let the others. It's time to meet my first inmate. He's been in prison before. 
this time is on drug charges. I feel tense. Any jail can be explosive, but I don't want to say anything that oversteps the line. Hi. What, um, how long have you been here in the, in the, in, in the prison? Got about 20 years in jail. Really? When you go out, you the gangs on the outside, you have to go back into that gang? You can't get out of that? Is it? I can answer that question. OK. OK. What are the dangers out there for these young lads? Let's presume that one, one guy was into, you know, into yeah, drugs, you know, running drugs or... That's the worst thing you can do, you know, get involved in drugs and smuggling and all that, you know, that's, they don't, they ain't no good. They're not going to take you nowhere over here or dying, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. What would you have to do on the street for them to, you know, whoever it is to come, you know, put them in the cemetery? What sort of things? I don't know, maybe you rip them off or, you know, or you make a bad deal. You never know, you know, it's hard to say that. It's hard to answer that. I think it's say, oh, this guy may rip me off or this guy maybe do something wrong. They got stopped and they put him over and they got busted and you got pissed off so you put a hit on it. Or you, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, man. And uh, good luck with everything. So getting busted by the cops could easily mean someone putting a hit on you. This is the area where... Uh... When the hit is going down, this, this, is where it will be. this is where it goes down. Yeah. See, the cartels belong to Mexico. These gangs are homegrown. They belong here in this region. This is, this is an area, the home of, it, of the uh, uh, Hermandad de Pistolero Latinos. It's a specific uh, gang that, that belongs here in this area. Mm -hmm. This is their birthplace. The Mexican Mafia has a strong area here in the border. Yeah. And so they control drugs along the border here. The, the sale of drugs and, and collecting uh, of taxes, to put to use a word, on, on other people's sale of drugs. Yeah. And so the cartels are reaching out to these people because there's already a structure in place and utilizing them and their structure to get whatever, sure. whatever uh, business they want to accomplish, either drugs on this side or eliminate targets. I'm now going to meet someone who has carried out these orders. The commander's told me that the man I'm going to meet has committed murder for the cartels. How you doing? How long, how long have you got to do? Right now? Yeah. How much time I going to do? 55. 55? 55. I'm not going to ask why. <laughs> Man. Yeah, they gave me 55 years and 50 running concurrent. How long have you done? Right now, uh, it's in November 2007. 2007? Yeah. Two years? Yeah, more than two years. Do they mean anything, your tattoos? Your oh, tattoos? Yeah. Uh, only this one. What does this one mean? Again, uh, the Texas Syndicate. That's your gang? Yeah. Are you, are you everybody in that? Is everybody uh, in the same gang? No, it's all just friends. Just friends? Yeah. Yeah, we got, they got to put the same people in the same tank. Oh, they have to? Yeah. Oh, because you know, you'd be... No, nah, we don't be. We, we peace and everything, but they just for the own reason, people. So they separate everybody. Yeah. Well, wish you all the best, man. All right. What would he get paid? Uh, anything from 10,000. To fifty thousand, a Mercedes Benz, or depending on the on the target. Yeah. So who would a cartel? Are they are they guys like you in suits and ties? No. Or they like him? The criminals are people like him. Are they? And is the cartel run by fear? It is fear among the members and among the people that they do business with. They're about bottom line. The Mexican mafia are probably the toughest, but the pistoleros they're the gun boys. They're actually the gun runners. But um, we, just, we were just talking in there, and he said, the meanest of the mean, the baddest of the bad of this big area are in here, under his watchful eye. The Rio Grande River is the thin line that keeps the bloody chaos of Mexico out of America. And so even the river is a battleground in the fight against the gangs. I want to find out how the battle is fought, so I'm heading to the US Border Patrol's HQ. 
You can see the river there. They basically aim at certain portions of the river where people cross. Yeah. And it could be undocumented migrants. It could be obviously smugglers, the drugs. From the sensor to the tower and then to them here. And then they'll dispatch the agents. For example, whatever sensor it is out on the ground. Morning, yes, Border Patrol Communications. Six five, can I help you? Well, I want to see this action for myself. So I'm back out on the prowl. This time with Nick Mazatics, a supervisory yeah, so, uh... border patrol agent. A lot of times we get call outs from the cameras. Hey, they're seeing some people crossing. You know, we'll take off, you know, try to intercept them, try to push them back. You know, we have apprehended um, marijuana loads here, so, and even in the day, so, you know, any, anything can happen. The Rio Grande runs the length of the US Mexico border for about 750 miles. Everything that's smuggled into Texas has to come across the river. This is the International Dividing Line. With Laredo's four city bridges all under checkpoint surveillance, some people take on the river itself. The murky green water is just yards wide in places, and in the dry season, it's barely waist deep. You know, a lot of these people are from the interior of Mexico, and they do not know how to swim. You know, so they're hanging on to some old inner tube a smuggler gave them, and that's their you know, their lifeline, basically. So there'll be across. points where they come and they can go to the smuggler and they'll say, right, you go yeah. on this certain time. And of course, these smugglers have, you know, scouts on the US side, scouts on the Mexican side, um, you know, on cell phones and vehicles, you know, trying to pinpoint where we're at, where the ground units are at. You know, they're looking for their opportunity, their opening, you know, to try to cross. That's the M4 carbine with the 223 round. That is an FN 303 less lethal launcher. It launches as a less lethal 68 caliber projectile that just kind of uses like an impact force. And that's been that's been pretty effective for us dealing with the rocking incidents. Usually it's the smugglers that are throwing the rocks, not necessarily the you know the aliens coming across. Not too long after finishing up on the river, I catch a sight of some of the smugglers myself. On the camera, they just saw one swim across. Look, there's a couple over the other side. You see him? See him over there? Hey, here he is. Here he is. Two of them. Yeah. Going back. They're going to swim back? Yeah, they're going to swim back. It just stays hiding. You can just see it through the bushes. There's a couple of them. See them hiding in the bushes. Just yards upstream, the Border Patrol agents have caught two women trying to cross illegally into America. But the men that smuggled them over are tantalizingly out of reach. And they know it. Here they go. There. They've got a rubber ring. Unbelievable. Just hiding in the brush. I'm in Laredo, Texas. I'm finding out how the cops police a city riddled with gang-related border crime. The US Border Patrol sees truckloads of contraband here every month. And I want to see some of this evidence for myself. This is Armando Romo. He's a veteran of 15 years in the Sheriff's Department. And he is responsible for a lot of the seizures I'm about to see. And on this road, what we usually have, we have a large quantities of marijuana. Large quantities. We're on the way to the sheriff's storage facility. This is where they keep all their evidence locked up. We see those two freights over there. They're yeah. all full of dope. Are they? Yeah. What street value is in one of those? A couple of million in each one. Wow. Or maybe even more. I want to see what the cartels are actually prepared to kill for. Now, smell. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> 
Why is Dave? I'll have a see him in life, I should think. Oh, it smells, doesn't it? That evidence is Thank about you, to be destroyed before it's had the chance to reach the marketplace of middle America. Inside are their most recent loads. That's our latest seizure they had at the guy's house. 1,384 pounds of pot marijuana. Oh, that's... That's weed. That's weed. Look at that. Yeah. How much is that worth? Well, it's $506 a pound. Yeah. I'll tell you, I got a pound there. These boys die for it. They die for it, huh? About $650,000. $600,000. Fucking hell. I don't like that shit. It's in cities like this where people die trying to profit from feeding America's drug demand. This is the last line of defense. It's the Laredo border checkpoint, 29 miles north of the city, on the Interstate 35. It's the only major highway traveling north from the Tex-Mex border. The volume of smuggling going upstate here is so high and the rewards are so great. The cops can never stop everyone. They can only make it as tough as possible. This is the second checkpoint coming in, and this is where they, if they get through the first one, you know, over the bridge, they come in here, and this is where they seem to capture most of the stuff. We've only been here 10 minutes and already we've got some action. There's a, a truck being pulled over, K9 alert, so they've pulled the truck over. It could be anything from the driver having a joint to people in the back or a million dollars worth of marijuana, so we'll just soon see. You can definitely smell marijuana in there. As soon as he opened that door, I could smell it. The dog alert right here under uh, underneath the, 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 the bunk bed. So uh, we see a couple of indicators, like the, all the, the, the screws been tampered. They, they, got, they removed these screws for some reason. Yeah, but they've got this machine here, and they just drive it up the side and it scans it, shows anything that shouldn't be in there. Each one of these machines costs $1.2 million and Laredo was the first in the country to get one. Well, what we do, we scan the whole, the whole truck. You can see the, the spare tire. Yep. Got the rim and the tire. Yep. There's nothing in there. We're done. No big haul this time, and the driver is allowed through the checkpoint. No stopping now till Dallas. With them dogs and that, it's, I'd say the chances of getting through are very minimal. I wouldn't try it. That night, I'm on my final patrol with Rummo. There's been a report of a dead body found on a bridge. We're only a few miles from the final border checkpoint I visited on the Interstate 35. Oh, my God, look. Fuck. See the body on there, look. Jesus. Okay. Here, here you go, right here. As you can see, there's a shoe there. Look, yeah. If you look down. Look at the blood over there. Yeah, there's the body right there. Oh, my God. He was hit by the train. Jesus. All I could see was a big mass of blood and flesh. You can actually smell the blood. But you can smell the blood. It's that, you know, it's only happened 15 minutes ago. What they do, they hide in the brush, because the checkpoint's down here. Then what they do, the train wakes them up. And they and they believe if they if they sleep near the tracks here, the rattlesnakes won't get them. So that's why they're here. Because what they do then, the train comes through slowly, they then wake up, they hop on it, and then they get straight through the barrier into America. He said it happens all the time. 
It's a chilling way to end what has been for me a mind-blowing visit to Laredo. Seeing this broken body close up is a tragic and graphic reminder of the terrible human cost that's paid out on this battleground border. It's unreal, man. Unreal. It's a city where the poorer population are at the mercy of the billion-dollar cartels. The highways are awash with drugs, and smuggling is an all-too-easy option. Being a cop here is not just about seizing contraband and catching illegal immigrants. It's about sheer dedication and the ability to stay focused in the face of a deadly enemy, which makes these guys amongst America's toughest cops.